They rose from the streets to the pinnacle of stardom. In live performance, in the mix, in the arena, they won. In 1986, Run DMC's Raising Hell went triple platinum and changed the course of music forever. Raising Hell to me is the greatest rap album of all time. But greatness wasn't enough to keep them at the top. Nobody knew the severity of my depression. I was really drunk. I can't even tell you what happened that year. Over 25 years, they confronted lawsuits, alcoholism, illness, rape charges, and finally murder. Enough to not only break up the band, but also a longtime friendship. I'm not satisfied with being Arthur Fonzarelli forever. I'm not only this one great thing that you guys love so much. This Run DMC thing, there's no love there. It's all business now. Nothing to lose. Leads you to where you are today. I believe in storytelling. It's gonna make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. Wow. They were doing what their new album promised. They were raising hell. Run DMC on stage is almost like you can't describe it in English words. They were tremendous performers. Really, really exciting live performance. And I say this to you as somebody who's seen James Brown. We were good. We were good live, period. For Joseph Simmons, better known as Run, Daryl McDaniels, AKA DMC or just D, and Jason Mizell, who went by the name Jam Master J, life as Run DMC had become an amazing whirlwind, culminating in their gigantic summer 1986 world tour. The Razor Hell tour was the pinnacle of anything in music history. Crazy. Nothing is like Raising Hell. Houdini was on the bill. Beastie Boys were on the bill. LL was on the bill. But, uh, you know, Run DMC were the headliners. That was the moment in musical history of bringing together hip hop and rock. If you could point to one perfect night for Run DMC, it's the night the Raising Hell tour came to New York's Madison Square Garden. Run D and J found themselves on their hometown's biggest stage. Sold out. We is the hottest thing on the planet. These neighborhood kids stepped on stage with that look, the jeans, jacket, I'm you, and we took this place over. And the way that we're gonna rock this arena, there ain't gonna be anything subtle about it. That night at MSG, Run had the crowd in the palm of his hand long before they launched into one of Raising Hell's biggest hits, the band's ode to its favorite footwear, My Adidas. I told the crowd, I walked up to the garden today, and the security guard was standing there and told me I couldn't get in. And I was like, I told him, this is what I'm telling the crowd, and I'm like, I beg your pardon? This is my mother effing garden. When he would do it in a place the size of the garden, it would just tear the house down. The crowd went crazy. And then he looked at D and said, what are those? And D said, Mom. And the whole place went crazy because all 20,000 people in there had on Adidas too. Being in Madison Square Garden, they jumping up and down. They feel like the floor is just going to cave in. That thundering sound was heard as far away as Germany, where an uptick in sales caught the attention of Adidas headquarters. But all of a sudden, they would check the charts and the graphs of sales. Was, was this? There's a rap group called Run DMC who, and it was just like my father did when I told him, hold up, what the hell is rapping? Who is Run DMC? And everybody talks about Michael Jordan, Ed Jordans, you know. It doesn't happen without Run DMC because before that, sneakers just sold to athletes. And if you wasn't an athlete, you was wearing shoes. Adidas ended up giving the band a $1.5 million endorsement deal, the start of a relationship that would last more than 20 years. Everything seemed to be going Run DMC's way, but as the Raising Hell tour rolled across America, a disturbing trend emerged where fights in the audience would occasionally overwhelm the music. When that happened, we always had rap riot 
headlines the next day, which were very hurtful. But even with those incidents, nothing prepared the band for what happened when the Raising Hell tour, down to its last few shows after three months on the road, hit Long Beach, California on August 17, 1986. Run DMC had no clue they were walking into a crossfire. The band never made it anywhere near the stage. I remember when we got to town for that concert, we was walking in and the dude said, man, it's gonna go down here tonight. And we looked and we said, yeah, it is. But we had no idea what he was talking about. What none of us knew about, because we were from New York, is that already by that time, before so-called gangster rap, believe it, there were gangsters in Los Angeles. At that particular time, black Los Angeles and black New York City were more than 3,000 miles apart. Two different gangs met at the show because they're gonna come to a show with, you know, Run DMC and LL Cool J and Houdini and the Beastie Boys. They're gonna be at the show. So they're in the same place at the same time and they have to share the same space and they bug out and there's a gang fight. One of the managers say, don't go out there, they're fighting. Okay, they're fighting hard. Okay. And all of a sudden, you know, you have all these people kind of rushing backstage and, you know, there was just, there wasn't enough security to contain all the kids once they started running back. And it wasn't like people were running back there to see the performance. They're just, you know, running wherever they can go to get away from, you know, like all this madness. I just stood on the stage and just watched this one big guy just walking down the aisle pointing all at it. So that means when he point, that means the gang's gonna go over there and beat up that person over there. He point over there, he going over, yo, it was crazy. I didn't understand, that was scary. We was locked in the dressing room, I had a chair, Hurricane and Jay had, um, they broke chairs up and said, if anybody coming through this door, they all getting it. Remember Vanessa Williams was in our dressing room, he said, yo, stop that screaming stuff, because if they come through here, it's going to go down. Somebody's leaving with some trauma in here. 45 people were beaten or stabbed before order was restored. The band immediately found themselves in the center of a media frenzy blaming them for the riot. D and J went on television to try to tamp down the flames. If it's violence at a football game, they don't say, hey, we're gonna put a stop to football out here because this team had a problem. I'm not gonna let no teams play. But with, with rap and music, they're trying to throw this, you know, rap and violence thing on us and Run DMC is gonna put a stop to that. We went in front of the press and it was like, is it true gangster and this and that and rap causes this and gangs and drugs and filth and prostitution. Now thing was this, just like good people like our music, pimps, prostitute and murderers and killers like it too. Run chose not to appear on TV with J and D. It was the first sign that something was wrong in the delicate alliance that was Run DMC. I left, I left and went to New York. D and J, the troopers, stayed and addressed the press. I think I caught them on whatever, CNN type thing, sitting there, D and J, talking about whatever they were saying to defend our honor. We wasn't defending Run DMC, we was defending hip hop. Their concert in Los Angeles the following night was canceled, and the Long Beach gang fight would affect rap music for years to come. I think that that night in Long Beach really was a defining moment for the people looking at hip hop as being violent. And it was a, from that point on, it was a struggle. Still, Run DMC remained the number one band in hip hop, just like Joe and Daryl had dreamed when they were just 14 years old. It was ninth grade, we were sitting there eating peanut butter and potato chips, just being kids and stuff like that. He was like, yo, when Russell lets me make a record, I'm gonna put you down. Mm -hmm. 